Hello and welcome to Surgery Secrets, where we go behind the scenes to uncover secrets about surgery you won't hear in the classroom. My name is Isabel, and today we are sitting down with Dr. Nancy Shipley. Let's get started. So we'll begin with some quick fire short answer questions. So would you be able to tell us your name? So my name is Nancy Yen Shipley. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. And where do you work? I work in Portland, Oregon in the US. And what does your job entail? So I'm a private practice orthopedic surgeon and I am fellowship trained in sports medicine and arthroscopy. So I take care of joints and bones and uh, focus on the shoulder um, with also knee and a little bit of general orthopedics and uh, bread and butter trauma thrown in. And what's your favorite color? My favorite color is sometimes blue, sometimes green. Uh, today's today's a pink mo uh, mood, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and your favorite food? It would definitely have to be sushi. Your favorite superhero? Ooh, um, well, I have to say I love Wonder Woman, but I also like Wolverine <laughs> so much so that I named my son after the character. <laughs> That's great. Um, who's your favorite musical artist? Um, I would say from nineties punk rock. I like the offspring from nineties hip hop. I love Snoop and Biggie. Um, maybe more recently, I listened to a lot of Portugal, the man. So I, I love music. So I have a lot of favorites out there. Mm -hmm. I think that's fair. There's, there's so many good ones out there. Um, your favorite movie. I, uh, this will surprise some people probably, uh, but like, I would say Ryan Reynolds and pretty much anything he's in cracks me up. And I really like Deadpool. <laughs> That's actually one I haven't seen. So I need to watch that one. Um, what's the, your favorite organ of the body? Oh, definitely the bones. <laughs> and the last book you read. Oh gosh. Um, Last book I read is, I think, Adam Grant's Originals. And um, can you recommend me a TV show? Ooh, um, I am only in the first season, just getting caught up, but I am loving Ted Lasso. Mm, yes, that's been a favorite from a lot of people so far. All right, so you passed the quick fire round, so we'll get onto the nitty gritty questions. Um, can you tell us? who your biggest influence was career-wise? I would say one of my biggest influences in entering medicine in the first place who just needed to utter a couple simple phrases to get me to take that leap to apply to medical school was a dear friend of my family, a dear friend of me. Um, she passed away this year. Um, Interestingly enough, uh, she is the mom of a college ex-boyfriend who <laughs> I didn't remain in, in touch with, but uh, she and I remained very, very close. I consider considered her to be like an aunt. And uh, when I didn't think I was good enough, smart enough, whatever, to apply to medical school, um, I asked her what she thought about applying to a number of different uh, types of postgraduate education. I thought about nursing school. Do I want to go to PT school? Um, and she said, you can be a physician. Why aren't you applying to medical school? And I remember thinking, oh, you know, I have always been interested in medicine. And I just, not that there's anything lesser about those other professions, but certainly, you know, the path is longer, it's challenging mm -hmm. with medical school and residency. And I just, I think I didn't give myself enough credit at the time. And then she gave me the nudge. And so that was one of my big inspirations for going into medicine. Well, I'm sorry about your loss, but um, yeah. she seems like a, a, a great lady and, and someone someone really important in your life. She was. Um, so you spoke a little bit about how like the path is longer in, in medical school. Um, 
Do you have a most memorable moment of your training? I would say, I think the day that I learned that I matched into orthopedic surgery when I was a medical student was a day that I would never forget. Um, obviously, I was really excited and happy to have um, gotten admission to medical school in the first place. But when I realized that I wanted to do orthopedic surgery and I couldn't imagine myself doing anything else, um, it's obviously a competitive field to get into. It's kind of high stress as you're applying and you're doing your rotations and trying to do well while learning. And um, the day that I found out that I had matched into a program, I didn't really care where at that <laughs> point I had already submitted my rank list and um, I was overjoyed. So that was a, a really huge and a memorable day for me. Mm -hmm. um, I also was uh, proposed to on that day. So oh, it's like it extra is. meaningful. <laughs> Um, and I would, <laughs> I would say during medical school, that was really impactful and, um, a lot, lot of memorable moments throughout my training as a resident. I think there were some times that made me laugh and some times that made me cry. Um, and I mean, overall, I had a really great experience in training. Uh, so there are a number of different instances that really stand out. Well, that seems like a really difficult day to compete with, with any other. <laughs> <laughs> but or, do you have any recent memorable moments that maybe come close to, come close to that one? Um, you know, I would say in practice, um, sometimes it's the little moments and of course they're the big ones that you'll never forget. Um, I think um, maybe one of the scarier moments uh, that I will never forget, and and sometimes you you need those, you need to encounter those to give you humility uh, and to realize um, just how fragile the human life is. Um, I had a patient who uh, I went into surgery. It was a proximal humerus fracture. This gentleman had a lot of medical issues. He really wasn't that healthy, um, but he needed to have surgery. Um, and uh, I was suspicious of a vascular injury and consulted the vascular surgeons and they um, cleared, so-called cleared him for surgery and stated, you know, we, we, they did the studies and they said, we, he, there's no way. They said, there's no way he has an arterial bleed. And, um, in the OR, uh, made the incision as I usually do. And, uh, the, I, I wasn't very, uh, deep into the incision and just clearing out some of the clot that was there. All of a sudden it was a geyser. Um, and, you know, in, in orthopedics, I think, especially, you know, I'm, I do shoulders, I do sports medicine, um, I take care of fractures, but in general, in orthopedics among the surgical fields, um, we, we don't often have those situations in the OR where all of a sudden there are now 25 people in the room mm -hmm. um, and two or three anesthesiologists and, you know, everybody's everybody's rushing in. Um, so this gentleman was crashing. Um, and, uh, it, you know, he had an axillary artery bleed that was undetected. Um, it probably clotted off and the, you know, the vascular surgeons didn't, didn't catch that and didn't think there was one. And so, um, all I could do was put my finger on it. I couldn't see it. It was too deep. Um, and eventually we had the cardiothoracic surgeon, uh, break scrub, uh, from surgery next door, um, and came in and, uh, you know, ended up, ended up repairing it. Um, and, uh, the guy survived, he was in his late nineties. And we, we think even because of his immigration, uh, years ago, the date of birth wasn't accurate. We think he actually was two years older than he was. So uh, he was already well into his late nineties and, and, uh, he was even older, but, uh, he pulled through, um, and it's kind of moments like those that really make you say, Ooh, you know, you learn from that. And when 
your gut tells you that, okay, we need to look deeper into this. Um, it's, it's a good thing to listen to. And so, you know, that's, that's definitely one of those things that you will never forget. Like I, uh, I actually see the anesthesiologist that I was working with that day all the time. And, and we still talk about it. It's a case that he would never forget either. And so, you know, I think that certain things like that will, will stand out, um, in training and both in practice and it's, uh, things like that, that will shape how you continue to evolve and change your practices, uh, you know, and I think, I, I don't think I would have necessarily done anything different in surgery, but I think that there was a little bit of me that was really worried preoperatively and maybe I should have pushed harder, you know, um, in, uh, investigating that. So, yeah, I would say that's definitely one of the most <laughs> impressionable uh, yeah. incidents that had happened in mm -hmm. practice. And lots of really good memories too. Yeah. Lots of really yeah. good standout memories that are, are hard to pick. Mm -hmm. um, those mm -hmm. moments kind of happen, you know, day to day mm -hmm. sometimes. I mean, not many people get to be in your position or, or even like understand what that's like to be in a surgical room and have that happen. Um, is there one thing, or maybe there might be a couple of things that people around you that aren't in medicine just don't understand about your job? I think, um, I think one thing that people don't understand, and for me, um, being married to someone who's also in medicine has been great for the both of us um, because we understand that it's not something where you can just clock out mm -hmm. um, and that your work oftentimes stays with you. And not that I don't, don't know how or that I don't give myself time for self-care and dedicate time for my family. But when you're really worried about something, you're thinking about a patient or you got a big case coming up, it's always kind of there. Um, and, you know, I think as a surgeon and a wife and a mom, um, you have to set up your, your personal life and your relationships such that there is an understanding that, it, you say, okay, I think I'm going to be home at six. And sometimes it's not. And, and you kind of have to have a, like, especially with childcare, um, you have to have a deep lineup um, and you have to have people who are flexible that are willing to take care of one of your most precious possessions at home um, and keep them safe so that you don't have to worry about that while you're at work, work taking care of your patients and, and, um, your patients that need your full focus at that time. So you kind of have to, we all always have to compartmentalize, um, our different parts of our lives, even though that, you know, they kind of flow into each other and, and you have to also really rely on having a good village in the, in the setting of being a parent and a surgeon, um, to kind of make sure you're doing things right in all the arenas. And it sounds, I mean, I can't put myself in, I can't even imagine what that's like, but it sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, and, I mean, it is, <laughs> <laughs> it, it um, is, but, um, you know, I think as, as physicians and surgeons, you know, and it, 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 those of us that go into training have a certain level of mm -hmm learning how to study and being organized and kind of planning ahead, we're all kind of a little bit type A. And so <laughs> it, it sort of takes some of that extending into our personal lives as well to make sure things are in order to make mm -hmm. sure you always have a plan A and a plan B and a plan C. Mm -hmm. It's like maybe borderline neurotic, but <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's kind of it how one has to be yeah. if they're going to be juggling these multiple roles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what would you say is the absolute best part of your job? I think the best part of my job is restoring function. Um, the, my favorite 
my favorite time with the patient. Obviously, I enjoy the workup and I enjoy the surgery. Obviously, I love the surgery because I'm a surgeon. But my favorite moment with the patient is actually when I say, okay, we're all done. You don't need to come back for follow-up. You know, go, go do what you're going to go do and, and you know where to find me if you need me. And it's, you know, it's kind of like one of the happiest goodbyes. Uh, when you finally discharge a patient from your practice because they have finished um, their ACL rehab, they're, they've finished their rotator cuff rehab, they're back to no restrictions, they're back to sport. And it's because the work that you have done as a surgeon together with others like the physical therapists, like the patient themselves and the, the blood, sweat and tears that they've put in have all kind of culminated in this like really happy goodbye and um, a goodbye back to um, normal life. Um, so that's, that's definitely one of the most rewarding parts of taking care of patients in this sphere. So I guess on the other end of that, what would you say is the worst part of your job? The worst part of the job is most definitely paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> I've gotten that one a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of a necessary part of our work and documentation and filling out forms. Um, but, you know, it takes us away from the actual care of our patients. I think um, navigating, jumping through the hoops of insurance authorizations um, instead of trusting physicians to make their best judgment mm -hmm. um, also adds a layer of stress and a layer of you know difficulty and inconvenience for the for the patient um, and causes delays. So I think that's definitely the the hardest part and the worst part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I interviewed a surgeon yesterday, and and it was the same answer. <laughs> it's the paperwork. Yeah. <laughs> we have a lot of work to do in fixing our profession. You know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it's a great profession. Um, it's a calling obviously, but mm -hmm. there, there are a lot of things that need to be fixed. Um, so I guess in terms of your practice, you kind of told the, the story earlier of, of the kind of big kerfuffle during surgery. Have you had any other moments that have been like the weirdest or, or messiest or, or kind of, yeah, I guess weirdest thing that's ever happened to you at work? Um, I would say maybe one instance, a couple instances that stand out um, along those lines um, usually involve taking care of patients who maybe have ideals that are contrary to yours. Um, and, you know, and I think that we are hearing and seeing a lot of this among uh, the voices of physicians and others in healthcare right now who are kind of hitting the wall in the pandemic and and trying to dig deep to hang on to empathy um, when they're taking care of individuals who have chosen to not be vaccinated but are um, critically ill and you know and we're expected to be empathetic and compassionate all the time. And, um, and so you're, you see a lot of that, but that, you know, that's a little bit of an aside uh, to your question. Um, to get back to that, um, I will say that I have taken care of patients where, you know, staring at me in the face, um, right next to where I'm making the incision, our tattoos, um, our Nazi tattoos, um, you know, white nationalist KKK tattoos. Um, and, you know, that doesn't really come up in discussion, but um, it's, you know, like I've had to just completely put aside judgment um, in those situations and still recognize that I had taken an oath to take care of human beings and that this is still a human being in front of me and that clinically I treat them no different and I give them the same care and the same surgery and the same attention to detail that I would to my own family. And, you know, and I think that's one of the things where 
uh, you know, I'm a human also. So it's always, you kind of like, you're taken aback when you see it and you're like, whoa, you know? Um, but then you sort of have to sort of snap out of that and just say, okay, I'm here to take care of this patient and treat them the same regardless. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, I, uh, just kind of going back to, um, healthcare, uh, uh, professionals in this pandemic, as we're kind of seeing third wave, fourth wave, um, we are starting to see that crack and we're starting to see that fatigue set in where, um, people are really just getting broken down and starting to feel pretty angry about something that could have been preventable. So, you know, I think that's the challenge in healthcare is, uh, is sort of putting personal feelings aside and, and we're starting to see that with something as, as massive and wide reaching as the, this pandemic that Mm -hmm. healthcare professionals are starting to really feel, uh, tough doing that. Mm -hmm. No, it definitely has been a struggle for healthcare workers with this pandemic. I, I can't imagine. Um, you spoke earlier about, um, kind of your family and your support system and kind of during these, these hard times, I assume that a support system is really needed. Um, could you speak a bit more on your support system? I draw support from my husband, from my kiddo and from my friends and also my colleagues, my, my partners in my clinic. So, you know, I just make sure that I try to build a good support system around me and, and make sure that I'm being reciprocal about it as well and supporting them back. Um, there are a number of tough times that I would have had trouble making it through alone. And it's just sometimes good to have somebody to talk things through with. And so, um, the support system has been great for me, um, through all of my training and my practice, um, and even more so in the last year and a half. So when you were in school, I guess, medical school, or even before medical school, did you imagine yourself living your current life? No, I think, I think (laughs) it's, you know, I, I constantly surprise myself. Um, (laughs) I, I didn't have a straight line going into medicine. I took several years off between undergrad and medicine. Um, and you know, I, I, I'm not sure I knew what I was doing when I was 21. <laughs> um, I worked in the snowboarding industry cause I thought that was cool and oh, no fun way. and just trying to figure out, you know, what I wanted to do when I was ready to start adulting mm-hmm. and, <laughs> You know, and it was just sort of a roundabout route to realize, hey, I, I actually think I do want to get into medicine. Um, but, you know, I, I really just try to chase things that I'm passionate about. And, you know, in recent years, I've kind of rediscovered that. I think, you, you know, you don't get somewhere like whether it's be- becoming an attending after you finish your training and you say, okay, I've made it. Like you, you have to keep looking at ways to grow. And, you know, even if that is staying within the medical field, you know, there are things that you can do to make sure that you're still learning and growing and, and kind of paying attention to your, your personal development. Mm-hmm. So if you weren't doing your current job, what career do you think you'd most like to do? Well, um, you know, I think I'm already starting to do it, um, <laughs> but simultaneously and mm-hmm. sort of juggling both realms. Um, I really, in the past year and a half, two years, have discovered how much I enjoy podcasting. Mm-hmm. I enjoy the sharing of stories, and I've discovered that I love being a storyteller. I love making people laugh. I think I lost some of that. I've always had a a sense of humor and I've always appreciated comedy and I've always appreciated making other people laugh. It actually brings me so much joy. 
And I think I had lost that for a while. Cause I was on like on this, like I said, this straight and narrow path to go mm. through medicine and training and, you, you know, and medicine sometimes it, you know, needs to be super serious, right? Mm-hmm. We can't be cracking jokes when we're talking to people about cutting into them. And, and in recent years, I've kind of rediscovered that and figured out how to also make that part of my passion and part of my work. And so, you know, being a podcaster, um, doing my, my writing and also working on my first documentary series, which um, I'm doing now, uh, has really tapped into that creative side of me, uh, the the side of me that really wants and needs to be a storyteller and an entertainer. And so I think I'm already kind of dipping my toes into that alternate uh, thing if I weren't able to practice medicine. Well, that's so exciting that you get to do both. <laughs> yeah, very lucky. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I guess we've reached our last question here. Um, if you could go back, what advice would you give your younger self or someone considering your career? I think I would say, make sure you continue to follow your passions. And even though this is a lot of hard work to get from point A to point B, um, for example, in a surgical specialty, make sure you hang on to having fun. Um, even in working hard, there should be an undercurrent of your work, uh, that is fun to you. Um, and I think in, you know, non, uh, when I talk to non-medical people, uh, they don't always understand or appreciate that, that surgeries can be really fun. Uh, yes, we are trying to, restore function, we're making incisions, we're trying to protect the important structures that we don't want to get into while we're repairing or reconstructing the structures that we do want to. Um, I think it's important to hang on to the fun part of it. It has to light you up. You have to enjoy it. Um, Otherwise, this career is not worth pursuing. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Shipley, for joining us today on Surgery Secrets. It was a pleasure to have you join our series. Thank you. It was a pleasure being on. And there you have it. Join us next time for another exclusive look into surgery today. Follow us on LinkedIn for new Surgery Secrets episodes and check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. For more information on Surgery 101, head to our website, surgery101.org. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.